Hi everybody. Once again, greetings and salutations. Shall we try and take the next couple of years of early Rhodesian history in one big stride? Um, 1891, and the year started off very badly for the country. Mashana land had been cut off by heavy rains for almost three months. And whatever goods were available uh, were only to be had at very high prices. So it was a, a difficult season uh, for the settlers in our country. Internationally, the Portuguese were still smarting under the uh, humiliation and the indignation of uh, Forbes's attack on Mozambique. And so a st student army, uh, so-called, was raised uh, in Portugal and the intention was that it would come to Africa and uh, cross our borders and take us on. Well, it, it arrived in Africa, but I'm sorry to say it was ill-prepared for the hardships and the difficulties of this continent, particularly the diseases that they encountered. So uh, that army was uh, largely decimated and came to nothing, and uh, we never had a punch-up with them. However, uh, the local Portuguese in Mozambique did make another attempt to uh, recapture Manica land and um, I am happy to say that we were able to uh, repulse them, uh, very decisively so. And uh, I will not dwell on that except to say that for a while the, the frontier was quiet. Politically, England and Portugal did come to an accord uh, whereby Manica land uh, would be uncontested, it would be regarded as uh, British territory and uh, be part of Rhodesia. Uh, in return, Portugal got some territory to the south of the Zambezi River and that was of no concern to us and we weren't particularly interested in those developments there. But we now had um, a very good accord with Mozambique. Uh, Manica land was ours and uh, that was um, a, a, a worthwhile possession for us. The relationship with our neighbour in the east there was, was very good, very friendly, and it continued like that um, right up until the end of Portuguese rule there. <clears throat> to the south, things were not so good uh, with Uncle Paul's uh, South African Republic. Uh, a, a number of Boers had banded together, calling themselves the Ardendorf Trek, and the intention was to cross the frontier into our country and lay claim to certain sections of the territory. Well, we weren't going to tolerate that at all. And uh, Cecil Rhodes made a very direct approach to Uncle Paul and explained to him in no uncertain terms that uh, we were unhappy about that and we wouldn't stand for it. And Kruger, uh, to his credit, uh, I will say that um, he was reasonable. He understood uh, what was uh, meant by Rhodes's message to him and uh, accordingly he issued instructions that uh, his burghers, his citizens, were not to cross the, front, the frontier into Rhodesia. So that, uh, that, that helped a tremendous amount and later on when a similar trek was organised by another group of Boers, he again uh, stopped the incursion into our land. So. Um, it did an awful lot to ease the tensions between Rhodesia and South Africa at that time. But within the boundaries of Zambezia, uh, there were issues. The east and the south may have been peaceful, but to the west, the frontier, uh, badly defined as it was, between Mashona land and Manika land, uh, was not peaceful by any means. Uh, there were a lot of difficulties there. But there were other difficulties as well that the settlers faced um, in that country. And that was the ever-present threat of uh, diseases borne by the tsetse fly and mosquitoes. It was something that uh, struck <clears throat> without warning. It could uh, lay you and your whole family uh, to waste. Um, there was no known cure at that time. You could be well one minute and the next minute you could start uh, exhibiting signs uh, that you were infected and soon after you would, you would be dead. There are countless 
lost graves in Rhodesia where entire settler families were laid to rest, uh, killed off by tropical disease. And it didn't just affect uh, human beings, there were other diseases which affected domestic animals. And so uh, a settler might well find that his oxen and cattle were also decimated by these uh, invisible enemies. But uh, in the physical sense, <coughs> Uh, there was one problem that everybody hoped that they would never have to face. And that was the prospect that perhaps uh, Mashonaland would prove to be barren as far as uh, gold was concerned. And as time went by, it became quite evident that that was the case. And this was a great blow to many people. They had uh, set their hopes their dreams, and their prayers on, uh, on a life uh, where they would never be uh, in poverty again. And uh, all that would happen now was that they had sunk their, their efforts and in many cases their life savings into a dream that was shattered by the realization that the precious metal that was there, such as it was, was hardly worth the pickings. And this was a blow, of course, to the company, the British South Africa Company, who had invested a great deal of money, time and resources and effort into opening up Mishana land, only to find that um, there was, so to speak, uh, nothing of value there uh, in the sense of mineral resources. And it was, of course, a great blow to many of the, uh, the mine owners. Uh, lots of them had been members of uh, the Pioneer Corps and as part of their wages they had been offered farms. If you were a trooper you were entitled to a farm of 3,000 acres. If you were an officer in the Corps it would be 4,500 acres and in addition to the land you were given so many gold claims. And uh, when the Pioneer Corps was disbanded at Salisbury um, many of its members opted rather to, to pursue uh, the quest for gold and they abandoned the claims to the, the farmlands. And the company had been very clear right from the beginning, look, you can have a farm, um, but you have to occupy it. If the land is left uh, unattended, uh, we will take it away from you, you will not be entitled to it. So faced with the choice of becoming farmers and, uh, you know, devoting themselves to that or going out and discovering gold, <clears throat> most of them opted to go looking for gold. And now that there was no gold and they had no farms, they were faced with uh, bankruptcy. So it, it was a time of great disappointment. And I suppose nobody was more disappointed than Loban Gula himself. You see, apart from the provisions of the, the Rudd concession, uh, he had, in his own private capacity, approached the company and asked if they would, on his behalf, stake out some gold claims for him, which they did. And these two now uh, were meaningless. Uh, they amounted to nothing. And I dare say that uh, the king must have sat and, and pondered uh, the whole thing from time to time. And he must have asked himself, what was all the fuss about? <clears throat> There's no gold in Mishana land. But we've had all this anxiety and all this stress and threats of war from both sides and uh, over nothing. Do the white people really know what they are doing? And uh, I imagine that his thoughts must have run along those lines. The company realizing that uh, it was wasting its time looking for gold, um, decided that they better um, turn their attention elsewhere. It wasn't a simple matter for them to just, um, as it were, switch off the lights and tell the settlers, look, we're pulling out of here. Uh, there's no money yet to be made. So um, those of you who want to stay, be our guests. But we, we are leaving the land. Uh, that was not an option. Under the terms of the charter, they had responsibilities that they had to fulfill within a certain time period. And part of that was the occupation and development of, of Zambezia. So they couldn't pull out. And they decided in their wisdom that 
perhaps what we should do is look at agriculture. And so again, uh, this uh, quest was on to try and find farmers who would come and um, under a system of land grants, um, develop uh, the country in that way. But we need to understand when it is said that these people got farms from the company, these weren't farms in the sense that we understand them with buildings and paddocks and fields and orchards and everything else. 3,000 acres was just simply 3,000 acres of bush. And what did that bush consist of? Well, a lot of Rhodesia is very rocky country. So you had 3,000 acres and not all of it was arable. There were rocks, there were boulders, there were hills, there were wild animals, and some of these were exceedingly dangerous. If you think about things like crocodiles in rivers and streams, you can understand that it was a very inhospitable piece of countryside that you had now been given. And you were expected now to develop this on your own strength and on using your own money and your own resources and create a farm out of that. And it's no easy task um, for one man on his own to clear the bush and to level the ground and to plough it and to put in, put in crops and to harvest them and, and to do this in a profitable way. <clears throat> it's, a, it's an enormous task. One needs help. And in those days, there were no mechanical implements there to help a man. There were no such things as tractors. Uh, it had to be done manually and you needed labour. And where would you find labour? perhaps from the Shona people living around uh, the area where you had been given your farm. If you were lucky and you had an interpreter who could explain your position to these people, you could go to them and say, would you mind uh, considering taking up a job offer from me and come and, and work for me? That's if you could find an interpreter. <clears throat> but you would be very, very fortunate if you could find a group of African uh, Shona-speaking people who would be willing to leave their way of life and come and help you. You see, they had been living for centuries in a certain way. The, the woman worked in the fields, the, the young men looked after the livestock, the men did the thatching of the huts, and when they weren't occupied doing that, they would sit around in groups and they would debate things and talk, and, and, and life notwithstanding the attacks from the Matabili that took place every winter, um, life, generally speaking, was okay. You had a roof over your head at night. You had food in your stomach. Why would you give all that up to go and work for some white man dragging rocks out of the ground and digging tree stumps out? This hand-to-hand -hand combat of uh, turning the bush into a farm. Why would you do that? And what would the farmer offer? some pieces of tin uh, with the explanation that if you find a store somewhere uh, you could exchange this for whatever you want. <clears throat> Initially that kind of thing was very difficult. Africans weren't attracted by that at all <clears throat> but some were and um, we, must, uh, we must commend them for that. When you think of, of taking a leap out of the Iron Age into uh, an industrial age uh, like that almost overnight that's that's quite a feat and it shows the adaptability of uh, of the African um, and it, it, it's something I think that they that they really ought to be recognized for um, it's a very commendable and worthwhile trait that they display so now you've got labor you've cleared the land I mean, you've got all kinds of difficulties that you're facing. You, um, <clears throat> you're doing your work with uh, one eye on the bush to make sure that there are no predators out there stalking you or your livestock or your laborers. 
uh, with the other eye you are watching the bush to see that there are no marauding matabili around who might just as easily end your life as well. Because you see, the Matabili nation was to all intents and purposes not much different from the ancient Spartans. That was the kind of life that they led. They were a warrior nation. And now with the coming of the white man, all of a sudden it was expected of them to abandon that culture of theirs that they had had for so long. And, and there was nothing really to replace it. You know, just don't come here and don't cause trouble. That basically was the requirement. Uh, but w w what are they supposed to do? The, the, a young man's stature in the Matabili nation depended on how many Mashana he had killed and how many bullocks he owned. Um, and now one of the, the components of his identity had now suddenly been removed from him. So there were some Matabili warriors. And this is not true of, of the whole nation, but there were some who began to exhibit criminal tendencies. And what they would do is they would go over this, uh, as I said, uh, badly de uh, defined frontier into Mashana land and they'd go to the more remote uh, farms or, or mines. And so a warrior would pitch up there with a few of his buddies and they would ask to speak to the mine owner, for example, and uh, they would say, sir, we've, uh, we've come looking for work. And uh, the man would say to them, do you know anything about mining? Uh, no, but we're willing to learn. Okay, that's fine, because labor was at a premium, and if uh, you could get it, you took it with both hands. And so these people would be employed. And then they would wait for an opportune moment, and when it presented itself, they would uh, kill the owner, and his family, if they happened to be there, and any of the other employees, so that there would be no witnesses whatsoever. And then they would raid the place, take what they, they wanted or needed or could carry, and hightail it back over the, the border into Matabili land, safe in the knowledge that there would be no pursuit. You see, the whites were not allowed to encroach into Lobangura's territory. Yes, there were. Europeans living at Bulawayo who had been there long before the time of the Rudd concession. And uh, that was no problem. They could continue living there. But the settlers were prohibited by the company from going into Matabili land. So these uh, criminals would, would be quite safe there, knowing that the chances of them being discovered were almost zero. And then later on, when they feel that the dust has settled, they would then go back again into Mishona land, uh, another part uh, as far away as was possible from where they had committed these crimes and then play the same game again. And so this, this thing would be done over and over again. Now, <clears throat> I need to say that it, it, it wasn't commonplace, but it happened often enough for the white settlers to uh, become dissatisfied with the situation. And they complained to the company and said, you better do something about these Matabili because we can't live like this with this kind of thing going on all the time. You better stop it. And now, uh, to add to what I've said, uh, on a sort of African political level, uh, for want of a better expression, Lobangulas and Dunas uh, were also agitating uh, you know, we've got an army here, what's the percent of the army? We are supposed to be raiding uh, the Mashona and exacting what they called uh, taxes from them, tribute for the king, and this wasn't happening. And so Lobangula turned a, a kind of a blind eye to some of these Indunas crossing into Mashona land and going to uh, more remote areas where there were no white people anywhere and then continuing with this policy of raiding and um, descending upon a village and killing and raping and, and murdering and taking the cattle and uh, whoever they regarded as being eligible as prisoners uh, for the development and the expansion of the Matabili nation and these people would be taken back to Bulawayo and everybody else would be slaughtered. But the white man was no fool 
I mean, the settlers knew this kind of thing was going on, even though it was sort of beyond their reach. Um, but they heard the stories and they understood that the Matabili people were just really violent in their eyes. And they couldn't see how the land could possibly be developed beyond uh, where it was, uh, the point where it was in Mashana land, as long as this threat was there on the border. And it was difficult for the company to deal with this. They, I mean, they had given Loban Gula an undertaking that, to the effect that they would not interfere in, in his affairs there and he would not do that there. So the whole thing hinged upon the fact that there was no real evidence that any of this emanated from Lobangula himself. These were just like renegades within his nation, criminals, and human nature being what it is, one finds that everywhere. But the dissatisfaction continued. Uh, the white people were not happy with the situation. So added to all these difficulties that they were facing, there was one other issue which really drove them to distraction. And that was the policy of the company whereby they demanded that 50% uh, of all commercial income should revert to the company. And this was very hard. If you can try and imagine a situation where, say, a small mine owner who has really been struggling uh, to make ends meet, and he's got a, he's got a few pound in front of him uh, on the table, and, and now he's got, he's got laborers to pay, he's got um, rations to buy to provide uh, to them, uh, he's got his own needs as well. He's got to buy food. He's got to provide for his family. All these things have got to come out of the, the, the small amount that he makes out of his mining operation. But before he can even spend that, he's got to cut it in half. If he is sitting there with 100 pounds in front of him, 50 pounds of that he will have to take to the company office tomorrow and hand over. And you can, you can see that this would be a problem. And the dissatisfaction rose to such a uh, level that, that Rhodes himself had to travel to Salisbury to, to try and deal with this. And he met there with the representatives of the various mines. And uh, he listened to their complaints about this 50% that had to be handed over to the BSA company. And he tried to reason with the people and he put it to them in these terms. <clears throat> Listen, you have to understand that there is no government in this country in the sense that you understand government. Where there are uh, untold millions in the treasury and where budgets are drawn up annually and voted upon and projects are put in place and money is spent like that. This is not that kind of an administration. We are a commercial company in the same way that you are a commercial company. And we don't have unlimited resources, certainly not enough to develop an entire country. So it is your responsibility as well to make a contribution to this. You need lines of communication. You need proper railways and bridges and roads. Everything that you have here now is only temporary. You've got to invest in the future. Do not think of this as an expense to your enterprises. This is an investment. This 50% is not going into my pocket. It's not going into the company's general fund. This is going into your future. And when all these things have been constructed, and you will have them because we will move quickly on it, when all these things are in place, you will find that your costs are going to go down and your profits are going to go up and you're going to be far better off. But you will never get to that point unless you make the sacrifice now, today. Well, not everybody saw it in, in those terms. They, um, they disagreed with him, but there was nothing they could do about it. And uh, so the feeling set in that, well, if that's the case, 
I may as well up sticks and go and look for greener pastures elsewhere. There's no future in this country. And that was largely the sentiment of the settler population. So there was a, you know, there was a lot of unhappiness there at the time. <clears throat> and of course, there was unhappiness in Bulawayo as well. Um, the Mashona, according to our traditional history, uh, were always the underdogs. The Matabili raided them willy-nilly, with impunity, as the inclination took them. And that is how we understand history. And that is so, excepting for the fact that behind the scenes, that narrative was changing. And the, the, there was a balance of power that was slowly but steadily shifting and moving away from that situation. And what brought it about was that the Mashonas started using a trade route along the Zambezi River into Portuguese East Africa. And they, would, they had been doing this for a while before the arrival of the white man and going there with grain and other uh, produce and um, bartering this in exchange for firearms. And with firearms in their hands and the knowledge of how to care for these weapons and how to use them, things began to alter slowly. And so as weird as before, the Matabili would uh, go into Mashana land, um, attack a village, everybody would scatter and flee before them and they'd pursue these uh, people through the bush, uh, killing or capturing as they were able to, uh, setting the place on fire. I've spoken before about this kind of thing and, and you know what I'm referring to. That was now shifting because Instead of scattering, the Mashonas were now uh, taking refuge in the caves as they had done before, blockading the mouth of the cave with uh, thorn bushes and then waiting there for the Matabili, who would then come and try and remove the thorn bushes, uh, stabbing at the people inside, throwing their assegais into the cave. When they did that now, uh, they were very often met with a, with a volley of, of gunfire. And at that close range, point blank, many of the Matabili warriors met their end. And uh, those that weren't killed were badly wounded. And a lot of impis limped back to Bulawayo uh, with nothing to show for their efforts, except dead comrades. So there was a feeling amongst the Matabili that, you know, we've got, we got to stop this now, we've got to nip it in the bud, this shift of power, before we get to the point where we can no longer exercise our authority and dominion over these people. But the white man was standing in the way. So, you know, somehow Lobengula had to find a way of dealing with the whites and at the same time suppressing the, the Shona people and it, it was a difficult proposition. But the company itself handed him a way out of this. You see, there was a, a telegraph line that ran through part of Matabili land, and this was being vandalized and cut periodically. Uh, and as this problem wasn't solved, the company sent Loeb and Gula messages saying, if you don't stop this, there's going to be trouble. We won't accept this much longer. That line is not to be tampered with. And so, yeah, Loban Gula thought, here's my way out of this. And he called his Indunas together. And he said, listen, guys, officially, I'm telling you to go and look for those people who've been cutting the telephone lines. The, and, um, you know, that is what the, the, the reason for your mission is. You are going to go into Mashana land. Uh, to find these people and, uh, and to deal with them. But what I want you to do is, there are some chiefs there who refuse to pay tribute to me. And they are sending me messages saying, we are under British protection. What do we need to pay tribute to you for? Um, thank you very much. We can't help you. Don't bother us again. 
He said, I want you to go to those people and then you go and get what is mine and you bring it back here to me. And they said, Your Majesty, we understand loud and clear what you want. And so an impi of 3,000 men was uh, marshaled there at Bulawayo. And a man by the name of Percy Crewe, who lived there. Now, Percy was the kind of guy who, 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 who talked straight uh, and coarse. Uh, you know, he called a spade a spade. And uh, he left an account of all the things that happened at, at Bulawayo there. A very interesting man, and I will talk more about him and what he saw later on. But Percy saw this force being marshaled. And uh, the man who had been placed in charge of them, the Induna, uh, Ungandan was his name. And um, uh, Percy knew this man. And he said, oh, it was the worst mistake Loban Gula ever made. How could he possibly take this guy? And this individual was a purebred Matabili warrior, stood over six foot tall, a well-built uh, um, but a man with a terrible attitude, arrogant and belligerent in his manner, and he hated white people. He regarded them as nothing but vermin, and they ought to be exterminated there in Bulawayo, but he couldn't do that because the king would not have allowed it. But this was, this was his bearing uh, toward any whites. And Percy says, I knew it. There's no way that a force this size can go into Mashona land and not at some point come into contact with whites. And when Umgandan comes into contact with whites and he's on a mission like this, it's inevitable he's going to try and kill them. There's, there's nothing good that's going to come from this enterprise. And, uh, and he was very concerned, uh, along with the other Europeans in Bulawayo, when they saw this, this force set out. So they crossed over the frontier into Mashona land. And an eyewitness there says that from one horizon to the other, all you saw was smoke as the Matabili torched one village after the other, killing and murdering people as they went. And they advanced up to a European settlement by the name of Victoria. And this was quite a large place. Um, there were a number of Europeans living there um, who had uh, Mashona, uh, employ, uh, employees uh, working there as um, uh, servants and uh, laborers. And these people were singled out by the Matabili. And they just ran amok amongst them, slaughtering them wherever they found them. Frederick Barnum, uh, an American, uh, writes of those times. And he says that many of those Mashona people, those servants, ran to their uh, employers and threw their arms around their waists and their, 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 their legs and hung on to them, screaming and begging and pleading for protection. And while this was going on, uh, the Matabili were just plunging their assegais into them. The whites were unarmed. Nobody expected this. There was no way that they anticipated this. Uh, all the terms of the Rudd concession had been observed religiously by Rhodes's company. There was no conceivable reason why a, a force of Matabili should suddenly come into a white settlement and, as it were, just obliterate the, uh, the Mashonas that were living and working there. What made it worse was that uh, these warriors uh, took their bloody spears and held them up before the faces of the, of the Europeans there and said to them, if we come back here and find you here, you are going to suffer the same fate as these people who work for you. And with that, the Matabili left Victoria and encamped on the side of a river. And from there they went out and continued this killing and pillaging. <clears throat> the message was sent to Salisbury and um, Dr. Jim and Dr. Jameson immediately set out for Victoria with a contingent. And he arrived there duly to find that the Matabili was still encamped near the, the settlement. And uh, he went there. I have said on a previous occasion that uh, he was an Induna himself. So he had the full authority to speak to these, uh, these people. And uh, he spoke to Umgundan and he said, listen, uh, what I want you to do is uh, you've got to go back across the river with all your warriors and go back to Bulawayo. And I want you to explain to the king 
that uh, this is a contravention of everything that we have agreed upon. And I don't want to see you people back here in Mashona land again. Uh, and, and you are to do that immediately. And of course, uh, you can imagine that the uh, response was, and if we don't, to which Jameson said, I will hang the lot of you. Umgandan then spat at uh, Jameson's feet. Um, a, a, a tremendous insult um, showed no indication that he was going to comply with um, Jamison's orders. And Jamison spoke to him again and said, by nightfall, I want you across the river, otherwise I will open fire on you. So a, 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 a great deal of the Matabili force crossed the river to the other side. But they left uh, their chief uh, Induna with a rear guard, as it were, to see what, what the whites would do. After all, Jamison was standing there with a Captain Lendy next to him, and they had about 40 troopers. That was all. And they were 3,000 men. They had uh, never been engaged in battle, really, much less defeated. And the idea that this handful of soldiers would be able to take them on was ludicrous to them. But they left a, a rear guard there to to test the reaction of the whites and see, you know, do you really intend to take us on? Now, some historians say that Jamison just gave the order to fire before the deadline ran out. I don't know what the truth is. I don't think that it makes any difference, really. These people had committed crimes there. They had threatened further crimes. And uh, if they showed no indication of complying, why wait until nightfall? So uh, at any rate, the troopers opened fire. And again, some say the Matabili opened fire first and the troopers retaliated. And some said it was the other way around. But whatever it was, when the firing stopped briefly, uh, a number of Matabili were dead, including their chief Nduna Ungandan, um, shot in the chest. The others fled over the river and they were lying in hiding in the bush around the scene a great many Mashona who had fled Victoria and were now taking cover and hoping and praying that they would not be discovered by the Matabili who had fully expected to witness with their own eyes the annihilation of uh, Captain Lendy's uh, detachment of troopers there who instead saw the Matabili in flight. So these Mashana appeared out of the bush, grabbed whatever weapons that they could lay their hands on and uh, pursued the, the Matabili and took their vengeance out upon them for the terrible crimes that had been committed and that they had been uh, subjected to for so long. So uh, the Matabili were in full flight, uh, they had to get back to Bulawayo and uh, they, they suffered quite badly. When Jemison got back to Victoria, the mood of the people hadn't changed. They said, look, it's good enough that you've, you've chased them away. We appreciate that. But it can't stop there. We can't live our lives here constantly worried about the fact that these people might come back here. They've threatened to come back here and kill us, and we've seen the, the, their handiwork. We don't want that for ourselves and for our families. You have got to take whatever troopers you can marshal together, and you've got to march onto Bulawayo, and go and arrest uh, Lobangula, or kill him if you can't arrest him, but you've got to stop this Matabili threat right now. We will not uh, rest until this has been done. Now, a lot of people <coughs> today will tell you that Rhodes and Jamison were just waiting for an excuse to start a war. And despite what may have been written at the time by all kinds of hotheads, um, the, the reality was that there was no money for a war. The company could not afford anything like that. But apart from that, there were, there were political procedures as well, uh, prohibiting that kind of thing. Uh, the company, after all, was an agent of the British imperial government. And so things like that 
had to be referred to the High Commissioner in the Cape, who would then, uh, if, as he felt it necessary, confer with London on these matters. And so you had this whole delay and consultation and discussions uh, before approval could be given, before any military action could be taken. And this was not acceptable to, uh, to the settlers. And uh, they put it very plainly to the company, listen, <clears throat> either you get on top of this situation or you call in imperial troops here and let them deal with the Matabili. If you can't do any of that, then we, as a community, will pack up here to the last man and we leave this country as it is. And, and you, can, you can do with it what you want to, but we won't be here to help. And Rhodes understood that he was at a crossroads. <clears throat> if he did nothing, there was this threat that the entire population would leave. Well, we know people talk like that. You know, it's, it's easy to say in the heat of the moment, but when it comes down to the nitty gritty, then it's, it's not that easy. And so a number of people probably would have left and a number would have stayed. But nonetheless, even a few people leaving would not have been uh, the kind of thing that Rhodes would have, have wanted. So uh, they got some kind of approval from the British government to, to go ahead and, and do whatever they, they felt was necessary on the circumstances, but you know, within what was acceptable and no, you know, no excessive, unnecessary uh, forced to be used. And when Rhodes put this to the directors of the company that, look, we are faced with war, I can't see us uh, getting out of this, uh, we'll have to do that. They said to him, listen, <clears throat> where's the money going to come from? We haven't got money to finance a war. And Rhodes said, well, the money will be found. And where do you think the money came from? It came out of his own pocket. Same place where the money for the Bayra to Amtali railway line came from. The same place where that telegraph line, uh, the funds for that, that crossed Rhodesia came from. The same place where the money to extend the railway from the Cape to the border of Rhodesia came from. All out of Rhodes' pockets. That, uh, that man not only invested his vision into the land and his emotions and, and, uh, and his influence, but his own personal fortune went into the development of Rhodesia. And I don't think anybody really knows to this day how much he personally put into that country. But it was considerable. Uh, he would rather uh, face financial personal ruin uh, than see the company, uh, the country collapse. So we were now ready for war. Uh, the money had been found. We had some sort of a nod from the imperial government. Uh, we had the settlers who, who wanted action and demanded it. And we had Loban Gula on the other side and it seemed that we had run out of options in, in talking to him. So the scene was set. And I think we're going to stop right there. Okay. Um, I'll carry on uh, next time. Uh, and tell you what happened uh, regarding the, uh, the outbreak of the first Matabili War. So, uh, folks, thank you very much for listening uh, so patiently. Um, please take care. Uh, God bless you. Uh, look after yourself. And until we meet again, cheers.